Focus 4, Class Audio, by Sue Kay, Vaughan Jones, Daniel Brayshaw, Linda Edwards, Beata Trapnell, and Dean Russell. Published by Pearson. Copyright Pearson Education Limited, 2016. CD1. Track 2. The Honey Diet. I'm trying the honey diet at the moment. Basically, you use honey instead of sugar. Also, you avoid junk food. You always have breakfast and you drink lots of water and full-fat milk. Since I started the diet, I've had so much more energy. I've lost a kilo this week. The Paleo Diet. I'm doing the paleo diet. I eat like the cavemen. My diet consists of meat, fish, fresh fruit and vegetables, eggs, nuts and seeds. I've given up wheat and dairy. I think it's a very natural way to eat. I've been following the paleo diet for two months, but I haven't lost any weight yet. The 5-2 diet. I've been doing the 5-2 diet since the 1st of January. It's simple. You eat normally on five days of the week, but on two days you only eat 500 calories. I'm on a 500 calorie day today and I'm having my breakfast. Scrambled egg and some smoked salmon. That's the kind of diet I like. CD1. Track 3. The other day I was speeding down a narrow, twisting mountain road on my bicycle. A man was driving very slowly uphill towards me. As I passed him, he honked his horn and he shouted at me. Cow! he yelled. I was surprised because I hadn't done anything wrong. But it wasn't the first time a driver had shouted names at me, so I ignored him and I carried on. I turned the corner and promptly crashed into a cow. CD1 Track 4 A I've got a good joke about football. The FA Cup final dinner and dance was taking place in London. The party had already started when three men arrived. They'd forgotten their tickets, but they told the bouncer, it's all right, we're friends of the referee. So the bouncer said, I've never heard of a referee with three friends, and threw them out. <laughs> B. A man was riding a tandem when a police officer stopped him. What's the matter, officer? asked the rider. You clearly haven't noticed, sir, but your wife fell off your tandem a couple of kilometres back. Oh, that's a relief, said the rider. I thought I'd gone deaf. <laughs> CD1 Track 5 1 Do you ever buy these products? Do you believe their claims? 2 I started using anti-aging cream a few months ago, but I know that it will require more than a cream to keep me young. 3 My children love chocolate spread. I've hidden it away because it's full of sugar and fat. When are they going to invent healthy chocolate? Four. It's impossible for a mouthwash to prevent illness. Don't believe everything you read in adverts. CD1. Track six. Pre-show rituals. In theatres all over London, artists are getting ready to perform. Most of them are too nervous to have dinner before the show, so how do they spend the few hours before the show begins? Here, three performers talk about their pre-show rituals. Tiny Temper is a singer. He prepares for a gig in the same way an athlete gets ready for a big event. About an hour before the gig, he does a lot of stretching. Sometimes he has a massage. Stephen Mangan is an actor. After six months of doing the same show eight times a week, the biggest challenge is getting himself into exactly the same mental state every night. 
He comes to the theatre, and sometimes he doesn't want to be there. But the fact that people are waiting to see him is a great motivating factor. Sarah Pascoe is a comedian. She always gets nervous before a gig. She looks at the script and tries not to think about the things that could go horribly wrong. She tells herself positive things like, "Who cares? Even if you're the worst comedian in the world, you've got a boyfriend who you love." CD one, track seven. How are you finding life in the UK? Oh, it's great, but everything's so expensive here. Really, more expensive than in the states? Oh yes, the cost of living is a lot higher in the UK, and salaries are quite a bit lower. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought that things were pretty similar in the UK and the USA, apart from the fact that everything is much bigger in the states. <laughs> yes, that's so true. When you go into a restaurant in the states. Food portions are enormous, a lot bigger than here in the UK. I never finish a meal in the states. Oh dear, what a waste! Not really. You can take the leftovers back home. Oh, that's good. So, what else is different? The most noticeable thing is the size of houses. They're much, much smaller here. Most houses in the states have basements and far more space. For instance, in the states, I have a walk-in closet for my clothes. Closet? Oh, that's a wardrobe. <laughs> Here in the UK, I have a small wardrobe for all my clothes. It's horrible. The other thing that's hard is housework. It's a lot harder here because there are fewer appliances than in the states. I need my American washer dryer. <laughs> is there anything that's better here? Oh, sure. Here, I can go to the doctor for free. Healthcare isn't as expensive as in the states. The other really good thing here is that employees get a lot more time off than they do in the states, and I love all the museums and historical buildings. British people visit museums far more frequently than Americans. Do you think you'll ever get used to living in the UK? Oh yes. The longer I live here, the more I like it. CD one. Track eight. One, the UK hasn't been invaded since 1066, when King Harold was defeated by William the Conqueror. Two, until 1913, it was legal to have children sent to other parts of the USA by parcel post. Three, one in eight workers in the USA has been employed by McDonald's at one time or another. Four. Eighty percent of everything on sale in the UK is bought by women. Five. When Abraham Lincoln became president of the USA in 1861, slaves were still being imported from Africa. During his presidency, Lincoln had slavery abolished. Six. In 1918, women over 30 were allowed to vote in elections in the UK. Women over twenty-one weren't allowed to vote until nineteen twenty-eight. Seven, eight billion chickens are consumed in the USA each year. Eight, the UK king Henry the Eighth had been married six times and had two of his wives executed by the time he died in fifteen forty-seven. CD one, track nine. One. Catch up on the news. Two. Fall behind with your homework. Three. Go on to further studies. Four. Hand in your assignment. Five. Look forward to new challenges. Six. Put off thinking about the exam. CD one. Track ten. One. A circle of friends. Two. A deep thinker. Three. Eager to do something. Four. 
have a gift for something. 5. Pay attention. 6. Reach a goal. 7. Soak up knowledge. CD 1. Track 11. 1. Determined. Single minded. 2. Hard working. Studious. 3. Intelligent. Bright. 4. Interested. Curious. 5. Logical. Analytic. 6. Sociable. Gregarious. CD 1. Track 12. 1. Determined. Persistent. 2. Hard working. Diligent. 3. Intelligent. Sharp. 4. Interested. Inquisitive. 5. Logical. Rational. 6. Sociable. Fun loving. CD 1. Track 13. What are you reading? Oh, this. It's a book about people who become successful because they do what they love doing. Oh, that sounds good. What sort of thing? Well, I'm just reading about a famous ballet dancer called Gillian Lynn. When she was a little girl, her teachers at school complained that she didn't pay attention and was always fidgeting and disturbing her classmates. So her mother arranged for her to see a psychologist to find out what her problem was. Oh, right. Anyway, the psychologist talked to the girl's mother and then he put some music on the radio and left Gillian on her own in his office. He told the mother to watch Gillian through a window and as soon as they left the room, the little girl got up and started dancing. Ah, oh, that's so clever. I know. The psychologist realised that Gillian didn't have a problem. She just had a gift for dancing. So what did the mother do? She sent her daughter to a dance school and Gillian ended up being a famous ballet dancer and choreographer. Wow, that's a great story. CD 1 Track 14 Memory Tips Greek philosopher Socrates famously said, Learning is remembering. So, how can we improve our memory? The key is to use your imagination. Here are two ways of remembering a shopping list of eight items. 1. Make up a dramatic narrative. First, imagine a huge loaf of bread and suddenly coffee squirts out of the top and makes a fountain of dark brown liquid. After a few seconds, the dark brown changes to white yoghurt. The yoghurt forms a river and it goes under a bridge. The bridge is a stake. Some black and green olives are crossing the bridge and some big brown eggs are chasing them. The olives hide behind a big carton of orange juice. You lift an olive to your mouth to eat and it turns into an onion, which tastes horrible. That's it. You've reached the end. 2. Visualise the items in a familiar place. Think of your home and get a mental image of the rooms in your house. 
Then put the items on the list one by one in specific places in the rooms. For instance, you imagine the bread on the doormat as you come in the door. Then you go into the living room and the coffee is in front of the television. The yogurt is on the sofa and the steak is stuck to the mirror on the wall, and so on. It's all about making personal associations. You get the idea. This method isn't just useful for memorizing shopping lists. Some famous people have used it to give a speech without using notes. CD one. Track fifteen. One. My earliest memory. I have very clear memories from the Christmas before my third birthday. I also remember my third birthday party vividly. And I remember other events very clearly from when I was three years old. Some people say I must have confused a memory with photos I've seen of the same events, but I've asked my mum about it, and she agrees that my memories are accurate. For some of them, there's no photographic evidence or anything that I could have used to create the memories in my head, so I believe they're real. Two. Most people in my family have rubbish memories, but my grandfather's amazing. He's not like other old people who are losing their memory and get confused. He's really switched on. He remembers dates and names and places. He can even recall in detail events that happened fifty years ago, and he's seventy-seven. I'm sixteen, and I can't remember what I did yesterday. I wish I had his memory. It would help me a lot in my exams. I asked him how he manages to remember things so well, and he says it's because he drinks green tea. I think it's because he reads a lot and stays active. He walks every day. He's much fitter than I am. Three. I've read that a lot of innocent people get convicted of crimes they didn't commit because a witness has identified them wrongly. That's terrible. Apparently, it's hard for most people to remember someone's face correctly, especially if you only see them for a few brief moments. I think I'd be really good at recognizing criminals, and I'm sure I wouldn't choose the wrong person in an identity parade because I never forget a face. I only have to see someone once, and I can remember them in detail. I just wish I had an equally good memory for names. Four. I saw a documentary last night about a boy who can't forget anything about his past life. He can tell you exactly what he was doing on a date and at a time in the past, and he can tell you details like what he was wearing, what he ate, what the weather was like. So you can say, "What did you do for your fifteenth birthday?" and he can remember everything about it. He's the only one in his family with a memory like that. In fact, they said he has a very rare condition. It has a name, but I can't remember it. It slipped my mind. CD one, track sixteen. Bread. Clear. Learn. Mean. Steak. Where. CD one, track seventeen. E, need, detail, mean, piece, ear, hear, career, clear. Ah,、uh, reserved. Squirt. Turn. Learn. E. Egg. Bread. A. Made. Detail. Pay. Steak. Air. Pear.
rare, where. CD1, track 18. 1. Drama, dramatize, dramatic. 2. Familiarity. Familiarize. Familiar. Three. Memory. Memorize. Memorable. Four. Person. Personalize. Personal. Five. Recognition. Recognize. Recognizable. Six. Vision. Visualize. Visual. CD one. Track nineteen. Lighting the spark of learning. Dr. Sugata Mitra, Professor of Educational Technology at Newcastle University, England, thinks it's time for a radical shake-up of education. He believes that the present education system is outdated because it doesn't prepare children for the jobs of the future, which have changed thanks to technology. For many years, he has been interested in a form of learning in which children are unsupervised and involved in self-learning and peer teaching. Dr. Mitra calls this methodology minimally invasive education and explains that it is based on the idea of using children's natural curiosity and then providing an environment where they can learn on their own. In 1999, he decided to test his ideas and set up an experiment now known as the hole in the wall experiment with children living in slums who didn't have access to good teachers at the time, he was working in New Delhi, and his place of work shared a wall with a slum. He cut a hole in the wall between his work premises and the adjoining slum, and placed a computer with internet access in a kiosk where children could use it freely. He then left them to use it unsupervised, and found that after only a month, the children had taught themselves how to use the computer and go online. He then repeated the hole-in-the-wall experiment in a village with no internet access. This time, he left the computer in a kiosk with just a few CDs in English. And when he went back after two months, the children surprised him by asking in English for a faster processor and a better mouse. When he asked how they knew all this, they said that they taught themselves some English so that they could understand the machine that only talked in English. The project was so successful that it became the inspiration for the hugely successful film Slumdog Millionaire. The film was based on a book entitled Q&A by Vikas Swarup. Swarup said that his book was inspired by the hole-in-the-wall experiment. He said, I realise that there's an innate ability in everyone to do something extraordinary, provided they are given an opportunity. In 2010... Dr. Mitra initiated another project for children in India, this time using a Skype connection. Mitra explains, When I last visited India, I asked the children what they would like to use Skype for most, and surprisingly, they said they wanted British grandmothers to read them fairy tales. Dr. Mitra recruited a British woman to spend a few hours a week reading to the children and set up webcams so that a life-size image of the storyteller is projected onto a wall in India. He now has 200 volunteers reading to the children via Skype. He also has retired teachers and educators regularly teaching slum children in India by Skype. The children are forming relationships with them, and the teachers, many of whom were upset at the thought of having finished their careers, have realised they're more important than ever he says. Hundreds of children in India are now learning from Skype grannies, 
but Dr. Mitra's plan is to create a school in the cloud using retired teachers as a resource for children all around the world to tap into. In 2013, Dr. Sugata Mitra was the winner of the $1 million TED Prize for his revolutionary work with Indian children and for showing the power of minimally invasive education. Dr. Mitra believes that technology should be seen not as a threat to teachers, but as an asset. Computers cannot replace good teachers, but they can get a high standard of education into the schools where they are needed most, he says. With the prize money, he will continue to fulfil his wish of building a school in the cloud, where children can find information and learn from one another. CD1 Track 20 1. A Radical Reorganization A Radical Shake-Up 2. Natural Ability Innate Ability 3. An Excellent Standard A High Standard 4. Plan an experiment. Set up an experiment. 5. Establish a relationship. Form a relationship. CD1. Track 21. Part 1. What do Barack Obama, Prince William, Paul McCartney... Diego Maradona and Bart Simpson have in common. They're all left-handed. In fact, 10% of the world population is left-handed, and I'm one of them. I have no idea why I use my left hand or what causes someone to be left-handed, but according to studies, it's a combination of genes and the environment that makes someone use one hand rather than the other. In left-handed people, the right hemisphere of the brain is dominant. This means left-handers tend to be creative and visual thinkers. You would therefore expect to find more left-handers working in music, the arts and media in general. Dominance of the right hemisphere also enables left-handers to be better at 3D perception – so it's no surprise that a high proportion of left-handers decide to become architects. Left-handers have good coordination too, which may explain why a greater number manage to pass their driving test first time. There is also a high percentage of lefties in the world of sport. Tennis champion Rafa Nadal is naturally right-handed, but he has chosen to play tennis with his left hand. He keeps winning, so it's a decision that seems to have worked out well for him. CD1 Track 22 Part 2 So that's the good news about being left-handed. The bad news is that manufacturers don't remember to make tools and machinery for left-handers. Society forces us to use objects that are designed for right-handed people, and this makes us look clumsy. As a child, I don't remember deciding that I was left-handed, but when my primary school teacher saw me using my left hand for writing and drawing, she encouraged me to swap hands. She didn't manage to change my natural inclination, and I didn't stop writing with my left hand. Why waste time trying to change someone's natural handedness? Just let them use the hand they feel comfortable with. You can't expect people to do what isn't natural to them. I once heard someone say that left-handed people were strange. But when you stop to think about famous historical figures who were left-handed, you can't avoid concluding that they were brilliant. I'm sure Leonardo da Vinci, Mahatma Gandhi, Albert Einstein, Winston Churchill and Marie Curie would agree. CD1 Track 23 These are both photos of people learning new things. Uh, in the first photo, a girl is in a car. 
it's hard to tell whether she's having a driving lesson or taking her driving test. The man in the passenger seat has got a pen, so the chances are he's an examiner. Based on his body language, uh, I'd say they might be about to crash. Clearly something is wrong. In the second photo, a boy is learning to play the guitar. Uh, he might be learning from a teacher or a friend. It's not easy to say whether he's a beginner or not, but he appears to be enjoying himself. The girl in the car, however, judging by the expression on her face, isn't enjoying the situation much at all. CD1 Track 24 Personally, I think it's absolutely vital. Actually, I'm having lessons at the moment, and I intend to take my test next year. My family and I live on the outskirts of the city, and it takes me ages to get to the centre on the bus for school, or to meet my friends. Driving into the city would be so much more convenient. So, for this reason, I feel it's really important that I learn. CD1 Track 25 1. I was beginning to fall behind in biology class, so I decided to go along to the local science centre where they were advertising some free workshops. I'm really interested in science, but the lessons in school are pretty dull and the teacher doesn't seem very motivated, but dropping out's not an option. At the centre though, things are very different, much more hands-on, and the instructor is really supportive. He actually voted my last project as the best in the group, which makes me want to work even harder. And the funny thing is, my marks at school have actually started to improve as a result. 2. I'm really into science fiction and was curious about what a course on creative writing would involve. One thing I didn't expect was that the course would be so demanding and I've already fallen behind a little. I'm not sure what the tutor will say if I don't catch up on the work that's due. I mean, it's free and we're all there voluntarily, even the tutor I believe, so I doubt I'll be asked to quit the course. I've never been the most hard-working person and the other students in class strike me as being rather studious, so I know I can't put off doing the work indefinitely. 3. I've always wanted to do a drama class, so when the opportunity came up to do one nearby, I jumped at the chance. The tutor's great, and the other students on the course all seem very self-motivated, which I guess is important on a free course such as this, otherwise you just wouldn't go, right? I plan to go on and study drama at university, and I dream of one day making a living out of being on stage. Naturally, I'm keen to soak up as much knowledge as I can, in the hope that this will help me improve my acting skills. 4. My high school grades in art are fine, but I just wanted to try some new approaches and was looking for inspiration. I was a little worried initially, as I've never been a very sociable person, but everybody at the art club struck me as being really open. The tutor came across as being very hard-working and focused, which I wasn't expecting, as you hear about these volunteer teachers being a bit lazy and unmotivated. The next assignment, painting or sketching something about our earliest memory, is rather challenging, but I've got lots of ideas, and I'm feeling really creative again. CD1 Track 26 Family 1 A distant relative 2 The extended family 3 The immediate family 4 an only child. Celebrations. Five. A reception. Six. A small gathering. Religious ceremonies. 
seven. A blessing. Eight. A mass. Nine. A priest. Ten. A shrine. CD one. Track twenty seven. One. Have a lump in your throat. Two. Lose sight of something. Three. Make a fuss of somebody. Four. Propose a toast. Five. Put on a party. Six. Shower somebody with gifts. CD one. Track twenty eight. One. Have a frog in your throat. Two. Lose count of something. Three. Make a fool of somebody. Four. Propose a motion. Five. Put on a concert. Six. Shower somebody with praise. CD one. Track twenty nine. One. The center of attention. Two. The highlight. Three. A once in a lifetime experience. Four. Really spoilt. Five. The time of my life. Six. Worth the effort. CD one. Track thirty. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to this talk about the science of love. My name is Ruby Niverton, and I'm a neuroscientist. That means I study what goes on in people's brains. It wasn't my original career plan. That was to be a biologist. But I later discovered that for me, the brain is a lot more interesting than the body. And the fact is that there is so much that we still don't understand about the workings of the mind. Something that neuroscientists have been taking an interest in recently is the nature of love. Experts from all over the world have been doing research into this fascinating aspect of human behaviour. Here in the UK, but also in China, where the most important recent research has been done, those studies show that the feeling we call love is actually a chemical reaction in the brain, and they have done tests to show this. It appears that the powerful feeling of loving someone has similar roots in the brain to the reasons we become hungry or thirsty. It's a very strong chemical need. In other words, it's like a drug, and as with a drug, this need builds up, or rather, it develops. First, you're attracted to another person. Then you start going out with them, and you really fall for them. You start to think about them all the time, and then you realize that you are madly in love. What has really happened is that you've developed an addiction. You can't live without the reaction you get from being with or thinking about this person. The evidence for this has come from different types of tests. One was filming the reactions of people when they were put in different situations, asked questions, or shown photos of people they loved. What the Chinese scientists also did was to put people in brain scanners to look at their brain activity when they looked at the photos. 
They then compared the results with the brain activity when the people were shown photos of people they had no feelings for. The results were pretty dramatic. It seems that deep in the centre of the brain, there is a very primitive part that developed a long time ago, about 65 million years in fact, long, long before the time, about 4 million years ago, when man is thought to have stood on two legs for the first time. Scientists believe that this is linked to very basic needs related to survival. It makes us want the things we need to live, like food, water and love, because love leads to a continuation of our species. Not just having babies, but bringing them up in secure family units until they are grown. Strangely, Scientists have also found that this area of the brain related to addiction is also active when we eat chocolate. And as with other things that we can be obsessed with, it's hard to cut off that obsession when we want to. Just as it's hard to stop eating chocolate, it's also very hard to stop loving someone even if you split up with that person. However, scientists are working on a cure for love. Who knows, maybe in a few years, a tablet will be on sale that can stop us hurting so much when the love of our life leaves us. Now, would that be a good or a bad thing? Let's have some questions, I think. Well CD1 Track 31 Church Confusion Courage Feature Japan Measure Official Pressure CD1 Track 32 Shrine Worship Attention Emotional Official Passionate Pressure Zh. Confusion Decision Measure Pleasure Ch Church Match Feature Picture J Japan Journey Courage Marriage CD1 Track 33 1 Ruby Niverton specializes in neurology 2 She is passionate about her latest project 3 She focused on observing brain activity 4 some broken-hearted people were involved in the experiment. 5. She concluded that love is associated with two different areas in the brain. CD1 Track 34 Text A 1. 299 hours 54 minutes one minute the teacher was talking about the Civil War, and the next minute he was gone. There, gone. No poof, no flash of light, no explosion. Sam Temple was sitting in third period history class staring blankly at the blackboard, but far away in his head. 
In his head, he was down at the beach, he and Quinn, down at the beach with their boards, yelling, bracing for that first plunge into the cold Pacific water. For a moment, he thought he had imagined it, the teacher disappearing. For a moment, he thought he'd slipped into a daydream. Sam turned to Mary Terrafino, who sat just to his left. You saw that, right? Mary was staring hard at the place where the teacher had been. Um, where's Mr. Trentlake? It was Quinn Gaither, Sam's best, maybe only, friend. Quinn sat right behind Sam. The two of them favored window seats because sometimes, if you caught just the right angle, you could actually see a tiny sliver of sparkling water between the school buildings and the homes beyond. He must have left, Mary said, not sounding like she believed it. Adilio, a new kid Sam found potentially interesting, said, No man, poof. He did a thing with his fingers that was a pretty good illustration of the concept. Kids were staring at one another, craning their necks this way and that, giggling nervously. No one was scared. No one was crying. The whole thing seemed kind of funny. Mr. Trentlake poofed, said Quinn with a suppressed giggle in his voice. Hey, someone said, where's Josh? Heads turned to look. Was he here today? Yes, he was here. He, he was right here next to me. Sam recognized the voice. Bet. Bouncing bet. He just, you know, disappeared, Bet said, just like Mr. Trentlake. The door to the hallway opened. Every eye locked on it. Mr. Trentlake was going to step in, maybe with Josh, and explain how he had pulled off this magic trick, and then get back to talking in his excited, strained voice about the civil war nobody cared about. But it wasn't Mr. Trentlake. It was Astrid Ellison, known as Astrid the Genius because she was, well, she was a genius. Astrid was in all the AP classes the school had. In some subjects, she was taking online courses from the university. Astrid had shoulder-length blonde hair and liked to wear starched white short-sleeved blouses that never failed to catch Sam's eye. Astrid was out of his league, Sam knew that, but there was no law against thinking about her. Where's your teacher? Astrid asked. There was a collective shrug. He poofed, Quinn said, like maybe it was funny. Isn't he out in the hallway? Mary asked. Astrid shook her head. Something weird is happening. My math study group? There were just three of us, plus the teacher. They all just disappeared. What? Sam said. Astrid looked right at him. He couldn't look away like he normally would, because her gaze wasn't challenging, skeptical like it usually was. It was scared. Her normally sharp, discerning blue eyes were wide, with way too much white showing. They're gone. They all just disappeared. What about your teacher? Adilio said. She's gone too, Astrid said. Gone? Poof, Quinn said. Not giggling so much now, starting to think maybe it wasn't a joke after all. CD1 Track 35 Text B Yacht found adrift in Bermuda Triangle A Royal Navy ship has found an abandoned yacht in the Western Atlantic. Crew from the Navy ship found clothes and personal belongings, including an open book on a bunk. We have learned that the boat belonged to a German couple, hoping to sail around the world. This incident is another in a catalogue of unexplained events in the area of the Atlantic known as the Bermuda Triangle, where planes, people and all types of vessels seem to go missing in mysterious circumstances. In 1918, the American naval vessel USS Cyclops disappeared without a trace. No wreckage was found nor any of the 300 crew. Then there is the case of Flight 19. In December 1945, 
five U.S. Navy bombers took off from Florida. They made several routine calls to base, but shortly afterwards, the planes and 14 men disappeared and were never seen or heard from again. There are many theories surrounding the mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle, ranging from strange weather conditions to paranormal events. But whether the ships and planes were destroyed by storms or abducted by aliens, it is a fact that numerous ships, planes and people have disappeared without explanation. CD1 Track 36 1. Abduct Abduction 2. Conceive Concept 3. Disappear Disappearance 4. Explode Explosion 5. Illustrate Illustration 6. Suppress Suppression CD1 Track 37 OK. A memorable day out. Hmm. Let's see. Right, so I'm going to tell you about a great day out that I had at the local lake. This took place about a month ago, on a Saturday, and I had been working really hard studying after school in the evenings and at weekends. I hadn't been out for weeks, and I felt like I really needed a break. So I called my friend Lisa, and we decided we would take a picnic and go to the lake not far from our village. The weather wasn't great, but we went anyway, and as soon as we got there, the sun came out. Initially, we were the only people there, but it's a popular spot, and as expected, other people soon started arriving. As we were sitting there on our blanket, another group of teenagers came and sat down right next to us. They were really friendly, and we chatted for a bit, then someone got a flying disc out. All of a sudden, the weather changed and out of the blue it started pouring with rain. We were going to go and then someone said we might as well go for a swim as we were wet anyway. Swimming in the rain was fantastic and fortunately, after it stopped raining, the sun came out again and we ended up staying all afternoon. Eventually, the evening came and it started to get cold so we headed home. Without a doubt, it was one of the best days I've had in ages and a welcome break from studying. We're planning to meet our new friends again as soon as we've finished our exams. Funnily enough, the best days are often the ones you don't really plan. CD1 Track 38 Right, so this is a story about a day I'll never forget. I've always loved music and last month my friend and I went to a DJing workshop. To begin with, we learnt about the equipment. We can't afford our own stuff yet, but fortunately we were able to use the decks, mixers and laptops at the centre. When we had understood the basics, it was time to have a go. Predictably, it was really difficult at first, but after a while I started to get the hang of it. It feels and sounds fantastic when you get it right. It turned out to be an unforgettable day, I can't wait for the next workshop. CD1 Track 39 I'm here today to talk about a very special family relationship. Twins. It's an interesting topic for me for two reasons. Firstly, I'm a psychologist, and the relationship between twins has always fascinated people of my profession. Secondly, and maybe more importantly, because it has given me a special interest, I'm a twin myself. As you all know, I'm sure, there are different types of twins, identical and fraternal. Fraternal twins are more common. These are twins that are born from different eggs in the mother. That's what I and my brother are. The other type of twin is identical. 
These are babies born from the same egg, and this is rarer. In fact, only one-third of all the twins in the world are identical. There's another interesting point. The percentage of identical twins around the world is more or less the same in every country, but it seems that geography has an effect on the number of fraternal twins. For example, in Japan, for every thousand births, there are about six sets of twins. However, in some parts of Africa, there are 20 sets. There's actually a school in England that at one point had 20 sets of twins attending classes. That beat the world record by 12 sets. A year ago, six sets of identical twins started at the school at the same time. All students at the school wear uniforms, so it was very hard to know who was who. Although the similar appearance of twins is very interesting, psychologists are particularly interested in another connection. A lot of people believe that twins have a psychic relationship, that they know what their brother or sister is thinking. But how true is this? Can twins communicate without words? Do they know when their twin is in danger? It's interesting, and here my reactions are different. As a scientist, I say no, psychic ability doesn't exist. But as a twin, I have to say that I'm not sure. There are many stories about twins around the world that have had big coincidences in their lives. Twin mothers in the USA had baby sons within two hours of each other, although they were supposed to have been born four weeks apart. And there's the famous case of twin Jims, who were separated at birth and brought up by different families. First, they married wives with the same name, Linda, then got married a second time to wives with the same name, Betty. They gave their sons the same name, and both of them called their dogs Toy. Many people would love to have a twin, but not all twins are happy about it. As a twin myself, I know that twins can have a lot of problems. One of these is that there is often a lot of competition between them, particularly when they're young. Both children want the parents' attention. Also, twins don't always like looking the same, and when they are older they try to dress differently and have different careers in order to be seen as individuals. The problem is that our appearance, abilities, interests and so on develop because of our DNA and therefore twins can't escape their similarity. CD1 Track 40 We went into the student cafeteria at London University and asked the question what makes a city a good place for young people? 1. Lisa My number one priority is open spaces for running. I like a city with plenty of parks and cheap sports facilities. I can't stand places where everything closes at 6 o'clock in the evening. I love cities that are hectic and never sleep, and where you have good nightlife with a wide choice of things to do, Cinema, theatre, music, restaurants. But young people don't have much money to spend, so it's important that all those things are affordable. 2. Gudrun I'm into art and fashion, so I love places like London where you can see some really crazy fashions and some good graffiti and other street art. I can't afford to go into expensive designer shops, so I like flea markets and second-hand clothes stores. Buses and underground are really expensive in London. Where I come from, I can go everywhere by bicycle, but it's too dangerous here. The cycle lanes are too narrow, and I'm afraid to use my bike, so I walk. But London's enormous, so I walk a lot. I guess it keeps me fit. But my ideal city has cheap public transport and safe cycle lanes. 3. Liang I'm studying here now, but when I finished my degree, I'll go back to China. I live in Shanghai, and it's an exciting modern city full of gleaming skyscrapers, but that's not important for me. It's a very expensive place to live, and often the smog is so thick that you can't see to the other side of the road. 
I'd rather live somewhere less polluted. But the best thing about Shanghai is that there are plenty of job opportunities. I just hope I get a good job when I go back. 4. Josh Well, one of the most important things for me is to be in a place with lots of other young people. I come from a picturesque town on the coast. Tourists love it. It's got quaint little back streets, leafy neighbourhoods and breathtaking views over the sea. But I don't care about those things. My hometown is full of retired people, so there's nothing for young people to do. I'd prefer to live in a run-down, inner-city area in a big city where there's lots going on. I think a city is more interesting if it's multicultural too. Where I'm from, most of the people who lived there were born there. CD1 Track 41 1 Benefit from 2 Offset by 3 Packed with 4 Prides itself on 5 Renowned for 6 Steeped in CD1 Track 42 1 Inner city area. 2. Bustling city. 3. Mouth watering food. 4. Quaint little back streets. 5. Leafy neighborhood. 6. Vibrant nightlife. 7. Iconic skyline. CD1. Track 43. At the moment, I'm living in a leafy neighbourhood of a picturesque town with quaint little back streets. It's so boring. I dream of a bustling city with a multicultural population and an iconic skyline of gleaming skyscrapers. I'd live in an inner city area where I could enjoy mouth-watering food, modern art, good music and vibrant nightlife. I'll go mad if I stay here. CD1 Track 44 1 Cosmopolitan city Sprawling city 2 Dramatic skyline. Impressive skyline. 3. Dull nightlife. Hectic nightlife. 4. Built up area. Urban area. 5. Cobbled back streets. Narrow back streets. 6. Exotic food. Plain food. 7. Respectable neighborhood. Run down neighborhood. CD1. Track 45. 1. Berlin's best kept secrets are the lakes. 2. New York is located at the mouth of the Hudson River. 3. Berlin is easy to get around by bike. 4. Toronto has a reliable network of buses. 5. The historical heart of Berlin is called Mitte. 6. 
Toronto's most famous landmark is the CN Tower. 7. The main sites are within walking distance of the centre of Berlin. 8. Toronto is the most youth-friendly city. CD1. Track 46. 1. Welcome to the Lifestyle Programme. Let's start with the shocking results of a recent survey. 35% of British people do not know any of their neighbours. Well, it's not a problem for residents of Spring Hill Co-Housing Project in the southwest of England. Spring Hill is a new housing development of 35 homes in a typical residential area. Residents have their own self-contained flats or houses and gardens, but share a common house for communal meals. The co-housing idea comes from Denmark, where it is well established. And according to the latest government housing figures, 8% of Danish people live in this way. There is growing interest around the world in the model as a provider of affordable, sustainable social housing. Building materials are natural or recycled. Spring Hill is not only sustainable in building terms, but in human terms too, encouraging the daily social contact that we know is a key to health and happiness. We're sure there'll be a 100% improvement in neighbourly relations at Spring Hill. And now for a look at a different kind of co-housing as we move on. 2. Come on, we're going to be late for school. What are you reading? Oh, it's one of Dad's business magazines. Have you seen the plans for this freedom ship? No, what is it? Well, it's just a concept at the moment, but they're planning to build a huge ship that looks like a floating tower block with an airport on top. That sounds a bit unstable, if you ask me. Let's have a look. Oh, that's amazing! It looks like a multi-storey car park. I wouldn't like to be on it in bad weather. Are they really going to build it? Only if it can be profitable. So, if you ask me, I'd be surprised. They need billions of dollars to even start, so it may never happen. It says here that there are people with disposable income who want to invest in the project and use it as their second home. But I shouldn't think many people would want to live on it. They want to make it nearly two kilometres long. Nearly two kilometres long! That doesn't sound possible! Where will it dock? According to this article, no ports will be big enough for it to enter, so it'll just be sailing around the world non-stop, with 50,000 people on board. Well, I won't be one of them. Come on, it's time to go. 3. Today, I'm reporting from the House and Home Show, and I'm going to start with a question. Where will you be living 20 years from now? Well, I think I found the answer to that question. You'll probably be living in the kind of house on show here. I'm looking around a fully connected smart home, and it's like walking into the future. But what is a smart home, and how will smart technology benefit our lives? OK, a smart home can be rewired, so household appliances such as fridges, light fixtures, security systems and thermostats can be controlled by the homeowner using a mobile device. One benefit is that the smart home can save energy costs. Even when you're not at home, with the tap of a finger on your mobile phone, you can switch off lights, close windows and control the heating. With the smart home, you gain more hours in the day. When you're running low on milk, your fridge can order more and it can be programmed to manage all your shopping. The fridge will even advise on recipes based on what you've got in stock. Domestic chores just got a lot easier. This is my dream home. CD1 Track 47 A What will you be doing? What will you have seen? Where will you be living? Where will you have been?
B. How long will you have been learning? How much will you have learnt? How long will you have been earning? How much will you have earned? CD1 Track 48 1. Afford Affordable 2. Dispose Disposable 3. Profit Profitable 4. Rely Reliable 5. Respect Respectable 6. Suit Suitable 7. Sustain Sustainable CD1 Track 49 Life on board the International Space Station At 6.41pm this Thursday, a small bright light will appear low in the night sky before disappearing in the darkness. Few people will notice, and even fewer will care, but for a handful of people, that light on the horizon is a place called home. What looks like a wandering star in the heavens is sunlight reflecting off the International Space Station. To get to the space station takes two days. The station flies at an altitude of about 350 kilometres, that's more than 30 times the cruising height of a jumbo jet, and travels at an incredible 28,000 kilometres per hour. In total, the living space on the station is the equivalent of roughly one and a half Boeing 747s. This living space is made up of different modules, built by Russians, Americans and other nations. There are 16 solar panels attached to the station, and they provide electrical power. The space station has a permanent crew of six. Although they have some training in how to live in weightlessness, when they first arrive on board the ISS, they take a while to get used to living without gravity, crashing into things as they try to move from one room to another. In time, people learn to fly down the length of the station without touching anything. As they live so close together, personal hygiene is essential, but the weightless conditions make washing difficult. Many astronauts use moist wipes. Hair washing is trickier. Sunita Williams, who spent 195 days on the space station, explains how she managed. Washing hair took time. I'd put a little water under my hair, pat it down with my hands so it wasn't splashing everywhere, then put some shampoo in my hand and move it around. Then I'd wet a towel and try to soak it up. It takes the space station one and a half hours to fly around the planet, meaning that it circles the globe 16 times a day. For those on board, the visual effect is spectacular. If the covers on the windows are opened, the light can be so blinding that astronauts reach for their sunglasses. But after 45 minutes of daylight, a dark line appears on the planet, dividing Earth into night and day. For a couple of seconds, the space station is bathed in light, which is a coppery colour, and then complete darkness. Another 45 minutes later, the sun rises to fill the station with brilliant light again. The short days and nights would disrupt the astronauts' body clocks, so a bedtime schedule is imposed by mission controllers. The crew are told when to put the shutters down on the windows and go to bed. Each of the crew has a cabin where they can attach a sleeping bag to the wall and settle down for the night. Unsurprisingly, falling asleep can be difficult. Just as you are nodding off, the lack of gravity can make you feel as though you've fallen off a ten-storey building. In place of an alarm clock, Sleeping crews are woken by music played over the communication system controlled by staff on the ground. When astronauts first arrive at the space station, they're in awe of the views. It is the sight of our planet that takes the breath away. On board, you can get a panoramic view of Earth. But for the really exceptional views, you need to step outside for a spacewalk. One astronaut describes the experience. Sometimes you feel that you are on this big flying building and it's going round the world. 
but most commonly you feel that someone is rolling this huge ball-shaped map beneath you. You have no feeling of motion. Those who have visited the space station can look at it shooting across the sky at night. They can imagine the astronauts in their sleeping bags and think, my goodness, I was there. CD1 Track 50 1 On board On each floor On the horizon 2 at an altitude of at 28,000 kilometers per hour at least 3 in a hurry in awe of in time in the night sky CD1 Welcome fellow teens to my video blog. Today's vlog is called How to Tidy Your Room in 10 Minutes. I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about. Your room's a total nightmare. It looks as if a bomb has exploded. There's loads of dirty washing. In fact, the whole floor is covered. There's no space anywhere. You have plenty of clothes, but you don't wear half of them because you can't find them. Most of them are in a pile because there are not enough drawers to put them in. You've had a number of opportunities to tidy your room, but you haven't. And now the very cool new friend you like is coming round. Very few of your friends know what a slob you are and you want to keep it like that. You don't have much time, so here are a few speed cleaning tips. CD1 Track 52 Find a laundry basket and put all the clothes on the floor into it. Too many clothes? OK. Get a couple of bin bags and put the rest in there. Then hide both of the bags in the wardrobe. If the cool friend sees either of the bags, just say it's a few things you're collecting for charity. The whole place smells of snacks, so take every half-empty drink and stale half-eaten crisp packet to the kitchen immediately. There's a big difference between messy and disgusting. There are a number of things that would give the wrong impression. Things like your huge pink teddy bear. Hide them. Make the bed. There's no excuse for an unmade bed. Open all the windows. Now you're ready. Just one more thing. Check your computer and delete any messages that say something like OMG, I'm so excited, I can't believe X is coming over. CD1 Track 53 I can't believe we've both been accepted into the same university. Isn't it great? I'm so excited. And we'll be living together. I know, I can't wait. What do you think about living in halls of residence? To be honest, I'm not sure. No, me neither. Do you know Jay? Yep, why? Well, his brother studies there and he says the halls are really old and noisy. Maybe we ought to just look for a place of our own. You're absolutely right. The question is, do we want to share with other people? It would probably be cheaper. Well, yeah, but wouldn't it be better to get our own place? Obviously, it depends how much it costs, but if we could find the right flat at the right price, I think I prefer not to share. I know what you mean, but I'm not convinced we'll be able to afford it. Why don't we meet halfway and look for shared accommodation, but in a place where we could have our own rooms? I suppose that could work. That way, we might even be able to afford something near the university. Given the choice, I'd rather be within walking or cycling distance. And you? Totally. I don't even mind if it's a small room, as long as it's close to the campus. That's settled then. So, let's have a look online and see what we can find. CD2 Track 1 1 Bring something out 2 Fork out ten pounds. Three. Knock ten pounds off. Four. 
rip somebody off. 5. Shop around. 6. Snap something up. 7. Splash out on something. CD2. Track 2. 1. Be broke. 2. Cost an arm and a leg. 3. Have money to burn. 4. Make ends meet. 5. Pay through the nose. CD2. Track 3. 1. A chain of cafes. A chain of supermarkets. 2. A range of products. A range of services. 3. Value for money. 4. Attract customers. 5. Cost a fortune. 6. Fill a gap in the market. 7. Discounted price. 8. Niche market. CD2. Track 4. 1. Owe money. Withdraw money. 2. Monopolize the market. Supply the market. 3. Deal with customers. Serve customers. 4. Be worth a fortune. Make a fortune. 5. Launch a product. Promote a product. 6. Cut prices. Raise prices. CD2. Track 5. Mum, guess what? Jamie got tickets for us to see Beyonce tonight. It was sold out, but he got them online. You know it's risky buying tickets online, don't you? Is it? The guy's meeting us outside the concert with the tickets. OK, but just be careful, won't you? Don't give him any money until you see the tickets. Don't worry. It'll be fine. Right, Jamie's picking me up in five minutes. Jamie? But he hasn't passed his driving test, has he? Yes, Mum. He passed it weeks ago. Oh, right. Wait a minute. You're not wearing my earrings, are you? Oh, um, yes, I am. I forgot to ask you. Sorry. You know they're worth a lot of money, don't you? Are they? But you never wear them, do you? Look, it's fine, but just don't lose them, will you? It's so easy to lose things at concerts. Stop worrying about everything, Mum. I'm always careful when I borrow your things, aren't I? CD2 Track 6 This is the place he told you to meet him, isn't it? Yes, it is. He said he'd be waiting at the main entrance. Did he? So why are we waiting at the staff entrance? Oh, no, you're right. Come on, we'd better hurry. <sighs> Well, let's call him, shall we? I'm sure he'll wait ten minutes. You took his phone number, didn't you? No, but he's got mine. If he's wondering where we are, he'll call me, won't he? Yes. I suppose he wants his cash. Don't lose it, will you? What cash? For the tickets. You haven't paid him yet, have you? Yes, I have. I transferred the money to his account online. Did you? Oh. Hey, that's him over there, isn't it? Is it? How do you know? He's holding up a piece of paper with your name on it. 
CD2 Track 7 1 We can go in now, can't we? 2 There's a support band on first, isn't there? 3 This is a great concert, isn't it? 4 Beyoncé toured the UK last year, didn't she? 5 Don't forget where we're sitting, will you? 6 Excuse me, nobody's seen a silver earring, have they? CD2 Track 8 Welcome to the shopping programme. In this episode, we're looking at the growing market in the UK for second-hand goods and the different places where you can buy and sell these pre-owned items. To get us started, we have a guest in the studio. Hello and welcome Martin Richards. Martin, you sell second-hand goods on the market, don't you? Can you tell us where you get them from? Yes, hello. Basically, I buy and sell the contents of luggage that is lost at airports and unclaimed by their owners. There are thousands of bags and suitcases that go missing at airports, aren't there? Yes, absolutely. 26 million checked bags go missing from international flights around the world every year. Heathrow is one of the busiest airports in the world, with nearly 200,000 people passing through the airport each day. Unsurprisingly, 45,000 bags go missing every month. Amazing! So how do you get hold of this unclaimed lost luggage and what do you do with it? Well, I certainly don't get them from the owners. <laughs> I go to an auction house in London. They buy the lost property from Heathrow Airport and sell it weekly to individuals like me. Then I have a stall on a market where I sell the clothes that come out of the lost suitcases. So how much do you pay and what kind of things do you get? Well, there's an element of chance when you buy a suitcase as you can't look inside before you bid for it. The better the suitcase, the more likely you are to find designer clothes. But you could be very unlucky with a high-quality bag and just find dirty socks. That's the chance you take. Luckily, the auctioneers open the bags and throw away anything horrible, like food that's gone off or wet stuff that's gone mouldy. When you buy suitcases, you just get clothes. Then they take out electrical goods and shoes and they sell those in separate lots. If we could just go back to what you were saying before, it's really surprising how many bags get lost. Have you any idea how this happens? Apparently, the most common cause of lost luggage is when people check in their bags either too far in advance or at the very last minute. Things can also get lost if passengers transfer to other flights. But you wouldn't believe what the most commonly lost thing is. Children's buggies. That's what I find most shocking. I just don't understand how people can leave the airport carrying the child and not remember the buggy. One last question, Martin. Do you feel a bit strange handling people's personal belongings? Um, that's a good question. The easy answer is no. I try to think about it as a job. But if I'm honest, I do often wonder who these people are, where they're from and where they were going. Once I found a wedding dress in one of the suitcases, I just hope they lost it on the way home. Absolutely. I'm sure those suitcases could tell a few stories. Thank you, Martin. Now let's head to the phone line. CD2 Track 9 Auction Boot Bought. Could. Gone. Goods. Lose. Put. Rotten. Stall. Through. Watch. CD2 Track 10 1 Or Auction Bought Stall 2 
o gone rotten watch 3 oo boot lose through 4 uh. could goods put cd2 track 11 1 major cause root cause Common cause. Two. Evening dress. Party dress. Wedding dress. Three. Domestic flight. Long haul flight. International flight. Four. Go mouldy. Go off. Go rotten. Five. Consumer goods. Stolen goods. Electrical goods. Six. Intellectual property. Private property. Lost property. CD2. Track 12. Genealogy. 1800s. Denim was a kind of cotton made in neem, denim. The first blue denim trousers were worn by sailors in Genoa. Gen in French. Bleu de Gen became blue jeans. 1850s. Blue jeans as we know them originated during the 1849 Californian gold rush. German storekeeper Levi Strauss and Latvian tailor Jacob Davis developed a stronger design using copper rivets. 1930s and 40s. At first, jeans were only popular in western USA and worn by cowboys. Their popularity spread after World War II. 1950s and 60s. Young people started wearing jeans to imitate young Hollywood stars like James Dean, but jeans became associated with rebellious behavior and were banned in schools. 2000s. Today, jeans are worn by everyone. Every American owns, on average, seven pairs of jeans. CD2, track 13. A. Japanese denim has a reputation among enthusiasts as being the best in the world. It has a cult following in Europe and America because of its amazing look and feel. The cloth is stiffer, denser, but far more comfortable than the mass-produced denim used in other countries. Japanese denim is different because they use traditional production techniques that have been abandoned elsewhere. Most denim today is produced using chemical dye, but Japanese denim uses natural dye, and the material is dipped up to 30 times to produce a deep, intense and rich colour that fades with time. These traditional methods are more labour-intensive, which makes the product more expensive, but Tokyo's trendsetters are willing to splash out on the perfect pair of jeans. B. We're hooked on jeans. In the UK alone, three pairs are sold every second of every day. But recently, modern methods of production have been causing environmental concerns. 
demand for jeans has increased so much that cotton farmers have to rely more and more on pesticides and fertilizers to raise their crops. Traditionally, jeans were dyed with a natural indigo dye. Nowadays, though, the dye is chemical and toxic, and even more chemicals are used to give the denim a vintage appearance. Distressed jeans are increasingly popular, and to achieve this look, the jeans are blasted with sand. Factory workers complained of breathing problems, and as a result, some brands of jeans have banned the process. Another issue is that it takes 6,000 litres of water to produce one pair of jeans. Jeans are fashionable, affordable and hard-wearing, but at what cost to the environment? C. Recent reports have suggested that skinny jeans enthusiasts may be damaging their health. Wearing jeans that are too tight could compress a major nerve on the outside of your thigh. This can lead to pain or loss of feeling in your legs. In most cases, the nerve damage can be reversed simply by taking the tight jeans off. Jeans that are tight around the waist can also make it difficult to digest your food. Health experts are urging young people who are committed to the skinny jeans look to choose a pair that have some stretch in them and are less likely to have a negative effect on the body. If you notice a strange sensation in your legs, it may be time to change your style. D. So, you've got that top quality pair of jeans you wanted. How can you keep them looking good and stop them from fading? Well, perhaps you're washing them too often. The CEO of Levi's caused a stir when he mentioned in public that he hadn't washed his jeans for over a year. He wanted to show how we can help the environment by using less water. Apparently, by washing our jeans in the machine once a week for two years, we use over 3,500 litres of water. His view is supported by other professionals who believe that it isn't necessary to wash jeans very often because the material is thick and it's the top of our bodies that sweats and makes clothes smelly, not the bottom. So, to help the environment and also keep our jeans looking good, wash less frequently. Soak in cold salt water, turn them inside out, and don't dry in sunlight. Oh yes, and you could wash them in vinegar. CD2 Track 14 1. Enthusiasm Enthusiastic Enthusiast 2. Environment Environmental Environmentalist 3. Expertise Expert Expert 4. Perfection Perfect Perfectionist 5. Product Production Productive Producer 6. Tradition Traditional Traditionalist 
CD2. Track 15. It's Bella's birthday tomorrow and I haven't got a present yet. Can you give me some ideas? Clothes? You definitely shouldn't buy clothes unless you know the correct size. If you get too small, she'll think she's fat. And if you get too big, she'll think you think she's fat. Oh, right. <laughs> Not clothes. How about jewellery? A nice ring? A ring? You need to be careful not to give the wrong message. A ring has a special meaning. Hmm. A bracelet? Yes. With a bracelet, you needn't worry about giving the wrong message. But it must be something really nice. Something she'll be proud to wear. How much do you want to spend? Uh, I don't know. No more than 20 euros. Right. You ought to forget jewellery. What's she into? Music. I could get concert tickets. That's good. But you ought to avoid buying them for too far ahead. You may split up and then it would be a waste of money. Oh, yeah. I know. Perfume. Do you know what she likes? No. <sighs> well, you ought to. I could get her the same as Mum wears. No! You mustn't do that. That's a really bad idea. Mums and teenagers don't wear the same perfume. Why? Mum's perfume's nice. Oh dear, this is more difficult than I thought. I wish I had more time. Should I get a voucher or is that boring? It's boring. You'd better ask her friends for some ideas before the shop's shut. They'll know exactly what she likes. Hurry! CD2. Track 16. How was the birthday? Oh, a bit of a disaster, actually. I should have listened to your advice, but I didn't. I got a bracelet. I thought it was such a bargain. 15 euros for a gold bracelet. I ought to have asked if it was real gold. You should have realised you couldn't get real gold for 15 euros. But anyway, didn't she like it? She's allergic to metal. She can only wear real gold. She put it on and got a big rash on her arm. We had to go to the doctors. Oh dear! Did you have to take the bracelet back? Yes, but I needn't have bothered. They refused to exchange it because I didn't have the receipt. Here you are. You can have it. Oh, thanks. CD2 Track 17 a. You look tired today. I am. I didn't have a very good evening yesterday. What happened? I went to the cinema with my brother. The ticket cost a lot and the film was terrible and very long. So it was an expensive evening and we went to bed late. B. Have you seen Katie's new haircut? No, what's it like? I don't think it suits her. I told her it made her nose look big. She was upset. C. That new girl came to my brother's birthday party last week. Oh, what's she like? I'm not sure if she's shy or rude, but she didn't speak to anyone and she left really early. CD2. Track 18. Oh, what a week. I'm exhausted. I'm glad it's Saturday. Well, don't relax too much. We need to do some food shopping. We don't even have coffee. Don't we? Well, you could have said something earlier. How am I supposed to function without coffee? Uh, well, you should have noticed yourself, if it's so important to you. Anyway, there's a food market on West Street today. I say we get there early. What? You mean leave the flat? Well, how else do you suggest we do the shopping, Oscar? Er, uh, online. I really can't be bothered to go out, Emma. Going to the market is time consuming and takes effort, but shopping online is quick and convenient. Click, 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 and it's done. Miraculous! It's the only way of shopping that allows you to stay on the sofa, and therefore it's clearly the best choice. Another reason is that instead of carrying heavy bags halfway across town, someone will deliver everything to the door. What could be easier? You are so lazy, Oscar. OK, 
When you compare the two, shopping online might require less effort, but I wouldn't choose it because you can't actually pick the fresh food yourself, can you? If you order online, they can send you all the old stuff. That's why I'd opt for the market. On top of that, it is actually good to leave the house and interact with other real people sometimes, you know? Hmm? I mean, I prefer going to the market simply because it's a colourful and lively place to spend some time. Also, shopping online isn't the best choice if you consider the environment. All those delivery trucks speeding round the city. Plus, don't forget, it's much more likely that the food at the market is locally grown and it's definitely the cheaper option. OK, OK, I get the message. How about you go to the market and I stay here? That's fine, Oscar. You can clean the kitchen and the bathroom while I do the shopping. Uh, on second thoughts, I'll come with you and help carry the bags. Oh, my hero. CD2 Track 19 I'm here in the studio with Anne Knight, a mystery shopper. It's very much a niche job and one that's full of secrecy. Can you tell me a little about your job and what it actually entails? Sure. Basically, I'm assigned a number of different stores in different locations and cities and asked to buy a certain something from a specific department or from a new product range. It could be in a chain of supermarkets, for example, a fast food restaurant or a large department store. I take extensive notes on the appearance and cleanliness of the store, the progression of the queue and the quality of customer service. I then have to write up detailed reports on the overall shopping experience. It's not as glamorous as most people think. Companies are spending millions each year. There's an increasing need for mystery shoppers and salaries can be impressive, I hear. Do your clients get good value for money? I believe so. Retailers are becoming increasingly aware of the competition from online stores and profits are being threatened. They are responding to the fact that shoppers who are actually prepared to set foot inside a store need to be offered a higher quality of service, a more unique and enjoyable shopping experience than they get online. Attracting new customers is desirable through improved customer service, but central to the idea is keeping regular visitors coming back. Does it work? Oh, definitely. Once the report has been produced, clients might respond, for example, by employing more cashiers to work the tills, which results in queues moving faster. Or maybe shop floors are cleaner or reorganised to make them more shopper-friendly. In particular, though, a few of the places I've visited have been awarded for the good quality of service to their customers. I'm totally convinced that it is a result of my efforts and that what I'm doing benefits everyone who goes shopping, and that's most satisfying. What else do you like about being a mystery shopper? Occasionally, we get an exclusive assignment, such as checking out a five-star restaurant or doing a report on a store that's on a cruise ship. Companies really have to spend vast sums for such a service, and the pay is very good. So, understandably, such jobs are quite rare. But it does add to the whole unpredictability of the work, which is nice. In many ways, the perfect job. Believe it or not, it's actually quite hard to enjoy a meal which costs a fortune in a plush restaurant because you can't sit there and take notes like you can in a store. Remembering lots of tiny details about the meal, the overall quality of the service and the food being served, as well as the much more personal interaction with the waiting staff, all of that can actually distract from the whole experience. And then, having to go home or back to the hotel late at night to write reports on everything while it's still fresh. You really do need to remain focused and detail-oriented. Hardly the perfect way to spend an evening. So, it's not all just about free meals, is it? Thank you, Anne. Stay tuned, because next up, Michael Bridges will be talking to me about... CD2 Track 20 1. Draw something up. 
two. Keep somebody on. Three. Pick something up. Four. Step down from something. Five. Take somebody on. Six. Take something up. CD2. Track 21. One. A contract expires. Two. Express interest in something. Three. Fill a vacant post. Fill a vacancy. Four. Living expenses. Five. Primary responsibilities. Six. Selection process. Seven. A sense of adventure. Eight. Target the youth market. CD2. Track 22. One. A passport expires. Two. Express concern about something. Three. Create a vacant post. Create a vacancy. Four. Living standards. Five. Collective responsibility. Six. Application process. Seven. A sense of achievement. Eight. Target the college sector.